Hi, everybody. I am back. And today we are going to focus on injuries to the knee. So let's get to it. We got a lot of slides to get through. Um, and also uh, online, there's some uh, limited resources for you available uh, on the knee as well. So um, the knee, wow, what a complicated joint this can be. Not quite as complicated as the shoulder, uh, but the knee can have a whole lot of things going on uh, with it that can be pretty complicated uh, for your evaluation. Uh, we've heard about the big injuries like ACL injuries. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about MCL injuries, meniscus injuries, uh, patellar injuries, and patellofemoral injuries today. So basically the anatomy of the knee, uh, again, we're not going to get uh, real heavy into anatomy and you will not be quizzed on anatomy, uh, but your ACL um, and your MCL are these ligaments or I'm sorry, the ACL is this ligament that, that, that comes diagonally from the femur and it goes down into the tibia. It is kind of hidden there. Um, oops, your posterior collateral or cruciate ligament um, goes posteriorly uh, from the femur down into the tibia as well. Uh, this uh, posterior cruciate ligament is most often injured with flexion where the ACL is most commonly injury, injured with extension, uh, force with extension. You've got your meniscus, there are menisci, who, which are these fluid, or I'm sorry, these cartilage shock absorbers inside the knee that protect bone on bone. You've got your, your medial side and your lateral side here. And then you've got your MCL um, that runs down from your femur all the way down uh, just past the tibial plateau or the tibial head. Uh, and then the lateral collateral ligament uh, on this side. So those are the main structures of the injuries we're going to talk about today. First thing about the knee, it's a hinge joint. Uh, it has some rotational component, not a whole lot, but a little bit of rotational component. Uh, the knee can endure a ton of stress. Uh, when we think about running and jumping and landing, um, we're putting a ton of stress on the knee uh, and it, for the most part, can handle it. Um, but it is highly susceptible to injuries. Um, when we, highly susceptible to injuries to the ligaments and, and also to the joint capsule. Uh, when I refer to the joint capsule, I'm talking about those, those ligaments and, and, and structures inside the knee. Uh, and typically that swelling will, will accumulate inside the knee or not on the superficial layer of the knee. So the bones of the knee, we have our femur, our patella, our tibia, and our fibula. Remember the fibula is the one on the outside of the knee, the tibia or outside of the lower leg. The tibia is on the inside of the lower leg. And of course the femur is up top. The patella is our kneecap. So there's another picture just to show you the, where the ligaments uh, run from and to. Uh, our muscles of the knee uh, that we have to worry about also with the thigh and groin, uh, the quadriceps are responsible for extending the knee and flexing the hip. So flexing the hip means you're bending over at the hip, extending the knee, straightening your leg. Um, those quadricep muscles there, the four of them, the rectus femoris, vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and vastus intermedius, our hamstrings, flex the knee and extend the hip. Our abductors or abductors, uh, they're the, the muscles on the lateral or outside of the, of the leg toward the hip, um, all the way up to the hip, I should say. Uh, they move the leg away from the midline or when your leg comes out, away from the body. Uh, and then the adductors or adductors are the medial muscles or those groin muscles that help move the leg toward the midline of the body. Um, those adductors are the stabilizing muscles for standing. So here's just a map. You can come back and study it if you want to. We are just going to keep moving on. So the knee capsule uh, refers to, as I said, the structure surrounding the knee. Um, there is synovial membrane inside uh, that knee capsule. Uh, and so when we damage the knee and, and we affect inside the joint capsule, we'll typically see quite a bit more swelling uh, because that synovial membrane or that synovial fluid has escaped um, into the knee joint. So um, the, the purpose of that knee capsule and, and, and that synovial membrane is just to provide um, more nutrients to the knee. It helps to lubricate the knee and helps things uh, functioning normally. So inside the capsule, we have the patella, the tibia, the fibula, the femur, the ligaments, the menisci, uh, and the bursa. And remember, bursa are those fluid-filled sacs that help act as shock absorbers. They're typically found right on joint lines uh, to cushion bone on bone. Um, the major ligaments of the knee, 
the tibial or the medial collateral ligament, which runs inside the knee, uh, the MCL, the fibular or lateral collateral ligament, which runs on the outside of the knee, our anterior cruciate ligament or ACL that runs diagonally and is responsible or most often injured during extension, force with extension, and then our PCL again injured on sudden forceful uh, uh, blow uh, with the knee in flexion. Think falling on a bent knee. That could be a, uh, a mechanism for injuring the posterior collateral ligament or posterior cruciate ligament, I'm sorry. Um, the medial and lateral collateral ligaments protect the knee from varus and valgus force. What valgus force is, is force applied to the outside of the knee. What varus force is, is force applied to the inside or opposite side of the knee. Obviously in the sports setting, valgus force is very common, varus force not so common. It'd be pretty difficult to get hit uh, pretty perpendicularly from the inside of the knee um, because we're running in the other leg it acts as a protecting device. So that just doesn't happen very often. LCL injury is not super, super common. The menisci are two semicircular fibrocartilaginous discs in the knee. So right here where my cursor is, these are the menisci. And their job, it's a very thin layer of very high density um, cartilage. And that is there to protect that bone on bone. Um, so if we have a tear in our, on our menisci, we can get that bone on bone there that, and that can, can fire up the nerves and we feel that um, um, with a lot of pain. So um, that, that cartilage, there, while it be very, very small, it's very, very important to the overall shock absorption of the knee. Uh, we talk a lot about Q angle, uh, especially when we talk about female athletes in particular. Um, many of you know that Female athletes are much at a much higher risk of ACL imp injuries uh, and other knee injuries uh, because their Q angle is wider. We can um, thank those uh, childbearing hips that we have that the, the pelvis is wider. And so if we draw that line from the ASIS down to the middle of our, of our knee and then back up to the ischial tuberosity, um, then that angle from males to females, it's much wider with females than it is males. And because of that, that wider Q angle, uh, it puts additional stress on the knee. Um, and that's why girls are more susceptible to ACL injuries than boys. So just assessing the knee, one of the things we want to do is we want to go through what we call hops. And we do this with, with every uh, injury that we have across the body. Uh, H in hops stands for history. Uh, what happened? right? Uh, do they have any past history uh, with this injury, with the knee injury? Uh, they injured it before. Um, what happened to them? What were they doing when they got hurt? Were they running? Were they stopping? Did they get hit from the front? Did they get hit from the side? Uh, those are kind of uh, things that we want to be asking them. We always want to ask if they hurt or felt a pop. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, in the case of the knee, hearing that pop or feeling that pop deep inside the knee is not a good sign. It's one of those signs of a possible ACL tear. So we definitely want to ask that question. Uh, we want to ask if, if, you know, if, if the pain has subsided since the onset of the injury, uh, we want to ask them if they have any swelling. And if they do have swelling, where that swelling has been located, is it around the kneecap or is it on the inside of the knee, on the outside of the knee, in the back of the knee, just knowing where that pain, that, that swelling is. And also the same question, for the pain. Where is the pain? Can they point with one finger where the pain is? Again, lots of structures in the knee. Um, all of the structures have very specific duties. Uh, so if they can point with one finger and we can narrow down our evaluation, that's, that's super helpful. So those are some of the questions that we want to ask when, when, when doing that history. Um, a lot of these questions will, will be things that your athletic trainers or your physicians will ask. Um, you as a coach, you know, you're not really going to know uh, in most cases, what all of the answers to this means. But sometimes if you ask these questions, at least you can um, give your athletic trainer or, or the doctor or, or somebody else, um, the parent, um, some good information on, on what happened to them and what they're feeling. Okay, locking, catching, grading, grinding. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute and what that means. So the O in hops uh, refers to observation. So what are you looking at? What are you seeing? Are they limping? Are they limping with a slightly bent knee? 
not wanting to put their, their legs straight? Are they walking with a straight leg, not wanting to bend their knee? Are they walking with their toe in or their toe out? If they're walking with their toe in, um, they may be trying to release some of the pressure on the lateral meniscus, right? So that the bones, when they walk, aren't grinding. If that can get torn, if they walk with their toe in, that'll open up the gap a little bit on the outside uh, so that they don't have that, that bone on bone pressure. Uh, and the opposite is true if they're walking with their toe out, trying to release some of the pressure on their medial side uh, of their knee. Uh, are we seeing any swelling or, or, or bruising uh, in the knee? Um, that swelling can tell us a whole lot. Typically on an ACL, there'll be a lot of swelling after about 24 hours. Uh, whereas maybe something with meniscus, there'll be just a tiny little bit of swelling. So understanding um, what that swelling could possibly mean. Uh, looking at muscle symmetry or atrophy. Um, this is in the case of, of chronic injuries in particular, that maybe they, they, they have lost a, a quite a bit of strength uh, and we may see some atrophy or, or shrinking of, of some muscle definition that they have. Um, and then just, can they bear weight? I mean, this is probably the obvious thing that we should probably ask right away. Can they bear weight? Um, we want to rule out those fractures, um, like we said before with the lower leg. Um, and then if we're pretty sure it's just soft tissue uh, and they, they are walking and they're limping, we want to just note uh, what kind of limp that is. So just looking at, on, on the observation, this is a good example of of, of swelling inside the capsule. We'll see quite a bit of, of fusion. If you put your hands on that and touch it, it'll feel like jello. Um, it's, a, it's a very spongy type feeling. Uh, and the athlete will also say it feels kind of spongy to them as well. That's a big deal. We want to get them into a doctor right away if you see anything like that. Uh, the P is palpation. Um, for you as a, as a coach, you're not really going to get into this, this part. Uh, you may want to start poking and prodding and see if you can elicit any of that point tenderness or any of that, uh, that stuff that might be indicative of a fracture. Uh, but for the most case, uh, for the most part, uh, this is what your medical providers are going to do along with the stress tests. You're not going to be administering those as a, as a, as a coach, uh, but it's important for you to understand, uh, what's happening with those stress tests so that you can kind of, you know, just know and appreciate um, the science behind uh, the injury and what um, the athletic trainer or your physician are looking for diagnostically to determine if an athlete can continue playing. So fractures of the femur or the patella, um, the femur, any type of fracture to the, to the upper leg, to the femur, that is a potentially life-threatening situation. Uh, the femur is the number one supplier of blood to the human body as the largest bone. So um, just understand that femur fractures are, are a very big deal. Um, in your first aid class, you probably talked about care of a femur fracture, which typically involves the application of a traction type splint. Um, but this is a, a, a type of injury that you definitely don't want to allow them to go by private vehicle. You don't want to put them in the car yourself and move them. This is something you want to call an ambulance and have uh, the EMTs or the paramedics take them uh, if you suspect a, a femur fracture has occurred. Um, also, there, there can be some type of stress fractures. We see this with running sports um, or, or, or any type of lower, lower extremity sports where there's um, uh, excessive overuse type injuries. Uh, that femoral neck or where that, 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 that femur comes in and, and joins uh, to the hip, um, that neck there can, can um, endure quite a bit of stress and, and you can develop some, some hairline type fractures in that uh, femoral neck region of, of the femur. Um, those also are, are things that you need to refer into a, a physician. And then patellar fractures or that kneecap can get fractured as well. Um, it's almost always the, the result of something hitting them, a traumatic event, something hitting directly onto that kneecap. Um, yeah, and those can be uh, pretty painful too. Just a small little round bone, um, but it's a very thick bone. And when they break, um, it's, uh, it's a pretty significant force. So signs of the fracture, uh, just pain at the injury site. Uh, again, difficulty walking or bearing weight. Uh, you may or may not see swelling. Uh, you may or may not see an obvious deformity. Um, it typically, almost always, is, is the result of a traumatic event. Again, when it's not a traumatic event, it's that stress type of a, a fracture that can develop. Uh, and again, the athlete may have heard or felt a snap or a pop. Um, you have to be aware of vascular necrosis, which means 
uh, the vascular supply can get cut off with fracture, um, and that can lead to uh, a potentially life-threatening situation, as I, as I said. So anytime that you suspect uh, a fracture to the femur in particular, again, call an ambulance right away. Your first aid care for fracture again. Uh, again, watch for signs of shock, that pale, cool, and clammy um, condition. You'll know it when you see it. They turn white as a ghost and they got that flat look about them. Um, so if you see that, just, oh, that's not good. Get them to lay down um, or get them down and, and, and if do the best you can at elevating um, or getting that traction splint applied. Um, if they have a, any open wounds, you can apply that sterile dressing after that time. Um, continue to monitor their vital signs. Um, make sure that their heart rate is okay. Um, if you can get a, a, you know, just testing the capillary refill on their foot, on their toes, then, 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 then that's great. Uh, but continue to monitor their pulse and their respiratory rate. How many, how many times they're breathing per, uh, per minute um, is, is a good uh, indication as well. And then arrange for transport to the, to the uh, hospital. Uh, MCL sprains, getting into those sprains again, and remember we have those, uh, this is normal, grade one sprains, there's a slight separation, grade two, there's a more moderate separation, and grade three, there's almost a complete or a full complete separation of the, of the ligament or the tissue. Um, depending on that grade, um, that will determine what kind of pain or laxity or discomfort that they're experiencing. Uh, the MCL, again, is that ligament on the inside, so this is your, your fibula on the outside. So we'll be on the inside here and it'll run from right up here um, from just above the knee, uh, the neck of the, the, or not the neck, the, the, the head of the femur here, all the way down to just below, uh, it's not on this graphic, but just below uh, the tibial plateau or the tibial head. So that MCL is right on the midline there. Um, it is caused by a severe blow or a significant blow to the outside of the leg right around the knee. So what causes that is they get hit on the outside of their knee and the inside of their sure knee, understand. their inside of their knee bows open. So imagine they get hit and because they get hit, maybe I could do this, they get hit, that inside of the knee opens up. So that is called a valgus force, okay? Um, almost always, that valgus force is accompanied by some degree of rotation of the lower leg, okay? It's pretty difficult to be completely straight and to get a, an entirely perpendicular force. When the body is in motion or moving and the other person that's hitting them is also in motion, typically they'll hit from a slight angle to the front or the back, which will cause that little bit of a rotational force to their low leg. So that outward twist. Again, uh, grade one MCL sprain, there's a slight tear uh, of, of the fibers of the, the ligament. Um, there is some joint stiffness that they'll experience. Um, again, it's like a grade one ankle sprain. Some people, it's like a near-death experience and it hurts. Um, they'll complain of achiness along the middle of their knee. If, you do, if they just kind of point to a large area on the inside of their knee and it says, they say it's really achy, um, that's a good sign um, that it's probably an MCL type tear. Um, in many cases, they, they will have normal range of motion. They'll be able to walk. They'll be able to jog. They'll be able to do these things, but they can only do these things with some discomfort or all the way up to some, some moderate degree of pain. So um, that's a grade one MCL sprain. A grade two MCL sprain, again, there's a, more of a significant tear getting into the deep capsular part of the ligament. Um, they'll have some slight laxity, which means they'll kind of feel like when they're walking that their, their knee wants to give out on them a little bit. It's kind of wobbly uh, and they'll express it that their knee just kind of wants to, to cave in on them a little bit on the inside. Um, they will have moderate to severe joint tightness. Um, they get a little bit more swelling uh, with these grade two MCL tears and that swelling likes to accumulate and kind of uh, wreak havoc with um, the, the joint's ability to move. Uh, and then they definitely have pain along the medial aspect of their knee. So a complete tear, a grade three tear, uh, this is when, um, you know, we, we definitely have a no-go for these kids for a while. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time and, and, and a really good knee brace um, to, to get them back into activity after several weeks of rest. Um, there's a complete tear uh, of the MCL. 
Um, it used to be that they would fix these things surgically. They're not doing that anymore. They're finding that these, this ligament will find itself again, will find itself and readhes. Um, so it just takes uh, quite a bit of time and, and quite a bit of rehabilitation. Um, with these athletes with grade two or a grade three sprain, even the grade one sprains, we want to make sure that they're getting into an athletic trainer or a physical therapist to get some the appropriate exercises to strengthen those things up. Uh, grade one sprains can become grade two sprains or grade three sprains really, really quickly uh, if they're not appropriately cared for and they're not managed appropriately with the, the right kind of brace. So uh, make sure that we're getting, um, getting these kids into a physician if they have any type of, of knee injury like this. Care for an MCL sprain, what you need to know right off the bat, if, if somebody gets hit from the outside and they're experiencing that inside pain, um, Rice, again, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Getting ice immediately on the joint is gonna be really, really critical. Um, give them crutches if they need them, um, especially with uh, higher grade MCL tears, uh, and LCL and ACL tears. Um, you don't want them to fall down. I know a lot of you travel in buses to, to go to games and they can step off that, that bus and they hit the bottom step and then their knee gives out. Uh, and then the next thing you know, they're dealing with either a more significant sprain or maybe even potentially a femur fracture so, um, or an ankle fracture or something like that. So get them crutches if they need them and, and, and teach them how to walk with those crutches and, and, and get a little extra support until they feel strong enough to be able to walk without them. Um, typically, um, we don't use knee immobilizers that'll immobilize the joint, uh, but braces are really important. Um, I'll talk about braces a little bit later on. But I think uh, an important thing for you to know both now and later on is that not in all knee braces are made the same. Uh, they're very specific to the anatomy of the kid. Uh, they, they fit very specific. Uh, and so getting a properly fitted brace and not just going down to your local sporting goods store and buying any type of knee brace. It, it, they're all very, very different for, for the, the, the many degrees of injuries that can happen to the knee. Um, once uh, your medical provider has deemed it's okay, one of a, a really good uh, exercise for these kids with, with MCL sprains or LCL sprains is to put them on a stationary bike, uh, turn their resistance down really, really low so they don't have a lot of resistance, uh, put the seat up. They're really having to fully extended. That's with that, then you can increase just a little bit more uh, resistance on the bike to, to get them going. You can give them some interval training to do. Um, we don't want to ever have a ton of resistance on that. That's not good for them, but a nice high seat and, and, and just spinning on that stationary bike can be really helpful for them uh, as a type of, of rehabilitation. Always continue the ice treatments as well. LCL sprays, these, this is pretty much the same. The, the grades are the same, grade one, grade two, grade three. Uh, this results from a blow to the inside of the knee. Again, it's pretty relatively rare uh, because we just don't get hit on the inside of our knee uh, from a perpendicular level. Um, they have pain and tenderness along the LCL um, on the outside of the knee. Um, the LCL is much shorter than the MCL, so you can pretty much feel it right at the joint line. Um, we follow the same management plan as, as the MCL tears on this. So just a little, I'm just going to show you these. I'm not going to ask you to do them. If you really want to get into it and you um, you want to look at these tests, then you can come back to this. Just valgus stress test. What they're doing is just trying to open up that knee uh, on the inside by applying a valgus force. Uh, and varus is uh, doing the exact opposite, uh, applying the pressure on the inside of the knee and trying to open that knee to see if that knee opens up on the outside. Uh, those are tests that we can use to, to detect or diagnose MCL or, or LCL tears. Typically, we'll only get positive tests at grade two or grade three level, though. ACL, uh, the mechanism of injury for an ACL tear, uh, basically the tibia is externally rotated or turned to the outside uh, with a valgus force applied. So we can get hit from, you know, the outside of the body and then the foot sticks in the, in the turf or into the ground and then rotates out with the foot firmly planted in the ground. That's a, a super common type of valgus force that's applied at the knee. Um, we get hyperextension of the knee. Uh, a lot of times we'll get um, athletes that get hit in the front with their knee straight and their knee buckles backwards. That's a super common uh, mechanism of injury. Um, sudden stopping, sudden starts, and then a sudden stop can lead to that hyperextension of the knee. 
Sometimes this happens with contact. Sometimes it happens what we call in space, meaning there's nobody around them and the knee just goes out. Okay, the, the, the foot just sticks in the ground and then they, they go. Um, I've seen a lot of these on the basketball court with somebody going for a breakaway layup and next thing you know, their foot's just stuck in the, on the court and they go down writhing in pain. Again, females are more uh, predisposed to these than males, although males get them, obviously. Uh, and then the, often when we tear an ACL, we also have damaged some of the surrounding structures, including the MCL uh, and the menisci um, can, can get damaged quite frequently with an ACL tear. Signs of an ACL tear, uh, if the athlete hurt or felt a pop, that's probably the most obvious one. Again, why I start with that question all the time. Um, <clears throat> some athletes say that the pain is really intense right after they do the injury, and then it will subside after a few minutes. And then they almost have this, this, this sense of confidence that, hey, no, I'm good. I can, I can go, I can go. And they'll get up and they'll walk off or sometimes they'll jog off. Um, that's kind of scary in itself because that ACL may not be intact. And um, what they can't do, they don't realize what they can't do until they can't do it. So they may not be able to do any sudden starts and stops. They may not be able to change directions or have any type of agility. So getting any time, if, if, if that athlete hurt or felt a pop, or if you suspect because of the mechanism of injury, you saw them get hit um, and their leg was fully extended, or they just had that sudden stop uh, in space, you need to get them evaluated. Um, this is a, a, a really big deal. Obviously, ACL injuries uh, necessitate nine to 12 months away and surgery. Um, so uh, just watch that. Watch for any weakness of, of, of their leg just getting out. You know, they, they feel like their, their, their leg just gives out when they're trying to walk. That's another sign. Um, and then the, the positive tests, which uh, your medical people will, will confirm. Care of the injury, uh, rest, ice, compression, elevation. They're going to need some type of a knee support and probably crutches. Um, it, it, it almost always results in surgery. There's a few different surgeries they'll use. They may grab a hamstring and, and, and cut out a piece of the hamstring and make a new ACL from that. They may take a piece of the patellar tendon right below the kneecap and cut a piece out and make a new uh, uh, um, cruciate ligament out of that. They may take a cadaver and make a... a uh, a new ACL out of that. Lots of different um, types of, uh, of grafts that physicians will use uh, based on the person's anatomy and, and that surgeon's individual preference. Either way, um, the surgery is going to come back really, really positive with, with good, a, good rehabilitation, and the athlete should be stronger than they were originally um, if they've done their exercises and, 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 and had a successful surgery. So looking at nine to 12 months away from activity, though. So this is just an active, uh, a, a test that they're looking at. They're stabilizing the femur and they're seeing if they can draw the, the patella or the tibia forward. Uh, that's a, a test for the ACL, looking for laxity. Here's another one, the anterior drawer. Uh, and again, these are just tests that your, your medical providers will do. So um, ACL programs, I've, I've put on the Moodle page a, a rehabilitation program or a pre habilitation program uh, to help you teach your athletes to prevent the injury from occurring. Obviously, teenage kids in particular are very exposed to ACL injuries. It happens far too often. Um, we see a lot of maturational changes uh, causing strength dis discrepancies. Uh, so getting these kids from an early age, from 11, 12, 13 years old on, and getting them in ACL strengthening programs or, or you know, teaching landing strategies and teaching jump strategies and all of these things, double leg and single leg can really uh, be helpful in helping to prevent ACL injuries. So that total body conditioning is really important. Uh, and again, those of you working in the junior high and high school levels, uh, I, I can't stress strongly enough uh, the importance of, of strengthening these kids and, and having them do exercises on a daily basis um, to strengthen those muscles uh, ligaments and tendons in, in the lower leg. Flexibility is also key, getting them flexible. Um, other things, um, flexibility, strength, like I said, control, balance. Uh, I'll let you uh, pull up the, the link I put on the Moodle page and, and review those exercises in that program and set up a program on your own. Importance of footwear also. 
All right, the PCL or the posterior cruciate ligament is uh, again, not as commonly injured as the ACL. We don't see a ton of this. Uh, typically the, the, the structure is injured when we fall on a bent knee. Uh, the pain will be on the posterior aspect or the backside of the knee. Um, it can also result from uh, severe rotational forces being applied to the knee, but those are a little bit more rare. Um, signs of a PCL, PCL injury, they felt that pop in the back of their knee. Uh, they have tenderness in the back of the knee. Um, you can pretty much put your fingers in there on the back side of the knee in between the tendons there, and you can palpate or feel uh, that area in the back of the knee, and that might elicit pain. Um, and then they have posterior laxity with a posterior sag test, which I'll show you in a second. Um, the, the PCL care is, again, rice, um, non-operative rehab. So we really want to focus on quad strength with these kids. Um, which again is part of our, our ACL prevention program is working on quad strength. So we're kind of getting a uh, double protection there with the ACL and PCL uh, and then range of motion exercises. So the posterior sag tests, uh, what I was saying uh, before, if we just put their, their hip flexed to 90 degrees here and their knee also flexed to 90 degrees and we cup the back of their heels, um, if they have a PCL tear, you'll see a divot right at the top of their tibia where their tibia meets their patella, if that makes sense, because that ligament on the bottom side is torn, so it can't hold it in place. So you'll see that dip or that divot right on the top there. So that's a, a, a quick and easy way for you to look and, and see if a PCL tear could be present. Meniscus injuries, another pretty common one for, for all of us, no matter the age or activity level. Um, these can be caused by either a valgus or varus force with torque as well. So there's some rotational component going on. Remember our menisci are those cartilage things that protect that bone on bone. They're typically aggravated with rotation. And when you think about it, when we're running, when we're walking, we're going from flexion to extension. And we have just that little bit of rotational component that the knee has. So we're constantly moving and those menisci are constantly being stressed. Um, when we have a tear of the meniscus, it's pretty difficult to diagnose for just the average layperson. Uh, but the general takeaways that I want to give you as coaches, if your athlete is experiencing pain right on the midline or right on the joint line where their, their, the bones of their lower leg meet the, the, the femur, um, and that pain is intensified when they're walking or when they're going up and down stairs, or when they're getting out in and out of bed or in and out of a car, uh, those are signs that the meniscus is very likely injured, okay? So going up and down stairs, in and out of a car, in and out of bed, okay? That causes that flexion extension with that slight rotational component that would be compressing that meniscus. So ask those types of questions uh, and see, the other thing that they may complain of is if there's a clicking or a popping sensation that's going on in the inside or the outside of their knee, uh, they may hear that, that, that clicking or popping, uh, or in some cases they may describe it as kind of a locking sensation that they feel their knee is locking up on them. Pain with squatting is another, uh, another thing that, that may aggravate it. So care for a meniscus injury. Again, we're gonna rice always. Um, Usually the physician will want to fix this with surgery, depending on the degree of the tear. Um, sometimes they, it's something that, that the surgeon will say, hey, we can wait till the end of the season. Sometimes it's something that they want to fix right away. Uh, it just depends on the kid and their pain tolerance and how bad the tear is. So always we want to refer the athlete to the physician to make those decisions. Um, if they do get surgery, um, depending on the, the, the type of tear it is, you're looking at, at them being out at least a month to two months, um, sometimes more depending on how much they had to do. So um, yeah, so different, different tests uh, that they do for, for um, menisci. Um, this is just a compression test where we're rotating that and compressing that joint, pushing down on the heel to compress that joint and push those bones together. Obviously pain would be elicited if they have a meniscus tear. So again, you as a coach probably don't wanna be the one to do this because then they're gonna be mad at you. Um, but the athletic trainer or the physician will do this. A McMurray's test, a little bit more uh, complicated, uh, adding flexion extension with internal and external rotation of the, of the lower leg, uh, feeling for these clunks at the joint line, and also trying to see if you're gonna elicit pain. Uh, 
here's one that's pretty easy for you, just holding their hands uh, and having them stand on one leg, leg and just having them twist. Okay, just do a little twist on that one leg. Um, and if that causes pain, that's a, a positive sign um, that the meniscus could be torn. So that Thessaly test, I think, would pro be probably one that, that you as a coach could administer pretty easily. Um, again, single leg test on the affected leg, just have them twist, make sure you're holding them because if they do start twisting, um, they could fall down really easy because it does cause pain or have them use the side of a table or something like that that they can brace themselves up on. Bursitis, as I said, we have a lot of little bursa sacs uh, in all of our joints. The knee is probably the, the site where we see the, the most frequent causes of bursitis. Um, those bursas are, are there to lubricate and protect the, the, the joint, um, to act as shock absorbers, if you will. Um, if a bursa gets uh, punctured or inflamed, uh, you'll see very localized swelling. So remember that picture I showed you before where that, the edema or the swelling was all throughout the knee? The, you won't see that as much with, with bursa uh, or bursitis. You will see just very localized swelling. So that swelling, there'll be pockets in certain areas around the knee. Um, these are the sites of the, there, there's lots more bursa in the knee, but these are the sites of the, the bursa that are most commonly injured. So we get the one that right underneath the patella or the pre-patellar bursa, um, falling on a bent knee. That's why volleyball players wear knee pads. Um, that bursa is super big. So when that thing punctures, um, that can put quite a bit of joint effusion in. Um, the infrapatellar bursa or the one right below the kneecap is another common site because we land on our knee when we fall or when we get tackled, those kind of things. So that bursa can get punctured quite, quite frequently. Um, those are, are, are the main two that I see. We also have the one around the pes anserin or our hamstring tendons where they come in and, and connect in the front of the knee. And then the super patellar bursa, which is uh, above the kneecap. Um, but these two primarily. So when you see them, again, look for that localized swelling. Think of the mechanism of injury that they had. Did they fall on, a, with, with, did they fall on their knee? Did, was their knee padded, uh, et cetera. Uh, what we wanna do for them, uh, if they've had a, a history of bursitis, one, we wanna ice it. Uh, try to get rid of that swelling so it can't collect around the joint. Uh, that's uh, rule number one, always get rid of the swelling. Um, and then we want to make sure that they have an appropriate knee pad. So if they're a football player or if they're a basketball player or something else, you may want to go talk to your volleyball coach and see where they got those nice, big, thick volleyball pads. Because uh, those are the type of pads that we want to put on those kids. A nice, thick, heavy, uh, super reinforced knee pad. Uh, that's going to fit nice and snugly and protect that area. Um, those bursa, once they start to, to, to heal, they'll be highly susceptible. That membrane is really, really thin and super susceptible to re-tearing. So um, for sure, we want to pad that up and, and, and protect them. Osteochondritis dissecans, uh, OCD. Um, you know, we see this all the time. You know, we get kids, especially those at uh, maturational age, adolescent years uh, developing OCD or, you know, getting jumpers to me, they can develop patellar tract issues. They, they have a softening, a deterioration of that articular cartilage in, inside the knee, uh, right on the base of the bones. And that cartilage gets inflamed and they get fluid in there and it can just be super painful and super annoying. So we want to um, make sure that we are, um, um, providing adequate support for them uh, with um, fluid, with, uh, or I'm sorry, with ice, and um, understand that, that they're gonna be uncomfortable doing most activities. I need to take a break for just a second. I'll be right back. I got an alarm going off. Ah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, other things with uh, osteochondritis dissecans, they'll have pain with walking, they'll have patient go uh, pain going up and down stairs, running, um, all of those things will aggravate the, 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 the injury or the, the, the condition. So we wanna make sure we're limiting the amount of time that they're, that they're spending doing those types of activities. Always following it up with ice, okay? Uh, the other thing that we have to worry about with, with OCD is just 
Uh, their patella isn't tracking really, really well. So more inflammation can get in there too. As the patella is having a hard time gliding across the joint, uh, that can increase the amount of, of swelling in the area. So again, ice, 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 ice. Um, other things, uh, IT band syndrome, um, the, the muscles that run along the lateral or outside of your leg, uh, that tendon as it as that turns to tendon and inserts into the knee, um, just right above the knee on the outside, we can get just extreme tightness of that tendon um, and that can cause significant pain. It's often um, misidentified as some type of a knee structural injury when actually it's a tight, tight, tight tendon. So doing proper stretching, uh, you can do some gentle massage on that to kind of loosen it up. Heat is always really, really good before activity uh, to kind of loosen that up and then uh, follow uh, the heat with some stretching. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just watch for that, that, that tightness of the knee. You'll be able to take your fingers and touch it and it'll be just hard as a rock right there. And, and as soon as you touch it, they'll say, yeah, that's the spot that hurts. Right. So another thing you can do is just freeze some water in a, in a paper cup, tear off the edges of the paper cup and just do some nice, uh, ice massage into that area. Just nice little circles, gliding circles and, and gradually start digging in deeper and deeper. Uh, to get a, a nice deep massage into that area to kind of loosen that muscle up. Um, here's some stretches that, that you can do for IT band tightness as well. Nice figure four stretch. Okay, other things um, I talked about uh, osteochondritis dissecans. Um, Osgood Slaughter's disease is, is the one that, that, that I was referring to, I'm sorry about that, that, that affects the adolescent kids. Um, it, it's also very closely connected with patellar tendonitis or jumper's knee. Um, it's caused by that continual strain on, on the patellar tendon. Uh, if you think about it, um, let's go over some anatomy really quickly. Here's your, your menisci here and your articular cartridge here uh, that we were talking about with osteochondritis dissecans. Um, so your quad tendons come in above your tendon. This area up here is your quadriceps tendon. Then it passes through your patella or underneath your patella, and then it turns into your patellar tendon. Okay, so this area right here of your patellar tendon is what we're talking about with, with patellar tendonitis here, or jumper's knee. When you're running, you're taking all of that absorption right over that patellar tendon. So it just like a rubber band, it continues to get bigger and get smaller, get bigger and get smaller. And that, that stress can lead to inflammation right below the knee. It's most common with kids in the developmental ages. So think of 11-year-olds on up to 15 and 16-year-olds. That's when this is the worst. Um, as they're growing and that muscular definition is developing and that patellar tendon is getting stronger and bigger and those quads are getting stronger and bigger, it's putting more stress inferiorly on the, the patellar tendon. So just be aware of that, that if they're experiencing dis some discomfort, uh, then uh, there's, there's lots of things we need to do. First and foremost, um, reduce the activity or eliminate the activity if need be uh, that's causing them stress. So that running or that jumping activity, we need to get them to settle down. Uh, a lot of these kids wanna do two or three sports during the same season. Um, that's not always good for a growing and developing kid. Um, so we need to get them to kind of calm down a little bit and get this thing to simmer down. Um, obviously, we're going to follow it up with ice and, and there's a, a, a strap that we can apply right underneath the kneecap that'll try to take some of that pressure off and, and try to reinforce that patellar tendon when, on those bouncing movements. If we do not take care of the knee, here's a, a copy of that strap. Um, and then I've also posted a tape job for you on the Moodle page. Um, these straps are okay. I don't think they're that great. I don't think they work really good. I much prefer just a simple tape job. Uh, and I've showed that to you uh, uh, on the Moodle page. So make sure you check that out and, and, and do the activity uh, of taping somebody. If you do not take care of patellar tendonitis or Osgood slaughters, it can go bad. And we see this with the 13 to 15 year old age group in particular. So what can happen with all of that strain being placed on the patellar tendon, it can actually tear or rip a piece of that tibia off that tibial plateau or that head, that tendon can evolve or rip 
tear a piece of that bone off. That's a big deal. And this is why kids need to rest after activity and why they can't overdo it, especially during those, those years of maturation. So just uh, be aware of that, that, that jumper's knee can, can evolve into something uh, specific uh, that is um, much a bigger problem than just uh, patellar tendonitis. Um, sending Larson Johansson is what it's called. Um, SLJ is uh, typically fixed with uh, surgery, um, and it can also mean time loss of up to two years for kids. So uh, we definitely don't want it to, to evolve to this point. Rest and quad exercises for sure. sure. Other common knee injuries, patellar subluxations and dislocations. Uh, a subluxation is a partial, uh, the, knee, the kneecap comes out partially and then goes back in. Um, if it's dislocated, it means it's all the way out. And when you get there, it's all the way out. Okay. Sublux means it can kind of ride around in there and it kind of tries to go out, doesn't make it all the way and then finds its way back in. Um, either way, it's showing patellar instability. So these are things that we really want to, again, work on quad strengthening exercises. Again, our quads come down with the quad tendon. They're responsible for tracking that patella and keeping it in its, in its space, making sure it doesn't go too far in or too far out or bounce up and down. So those quad strengthening exercises are gonna be super important. Um, patellar tracking issues are more common with female athletes than they are male. Um, a little bit because of that Q angle, but more because of that quad strength isn't as developed with females as it is with men or with boys. So again, get those, get those female athletes of yours in those quad strengthening exercises. Uh, and, and also focus, if I can say this, focus not just on full knee flexion, but working that last 30 degrees as well. So maybe you're doing quad extensions where you're bending the knee all the way, but then do another set of quad extensions where you're just doing little things. Do them both legs, but then also do sets with single legs. Uh, and that can help strengthen the VMO or the vastus medialis uh, uh, muscle on the inside of the knee that has a, a, a great deal of responsibility with kneecap tracking. If you see the obvious deformity, usually those, those dislocations will go to the outside of the knee or the lateral aspect of the knee. Uh, don't try to put it back in place yourself. Um, this is the disclaimer that I have to give you since you're coaches uh, and teachers. Um, this is not something that, that you're legally protected to do, um, let a medical provider be the one to put it back in place. And that's the case with all of them. The medial dislocations, yeah, that looks pretty painful because it is very painful. Um, that's just not typically the way that they go. Okay, so we'll skip these, these tests, um, but you can basically try to slide the patella around to see if it's, it's a little lax. Um, another test is just putting uh, inferior pressure on the patella and then just strengthen, straightening their leg. Uh, and if, that, if you feel that crunching or that popping sound, um, that's a, a sign that they have some type of patellofemoral issue uh, and they could use some quad strengthening exercises to, to help that patella track normally. Um, anyway, there's some other tests. You can come back and read these if you want. Don't do this test, it's hyperextension drop. Don't do that. That causes a lot of pain. Okay, the other thing, uh, fat pads, you also have these little fat pads, uh, that's completely normal fat pads. Fat pads are good. Fat pads are more shock absorbers or, or uh, um, force absorbers inside the, the knees. And, and fat pads also help cushion the knee and the joint when, when you're moving. Um, so fat pads can also be um, pinched or, or bruised as well. Very common injury. So total body conditioning is what we really want to do for knee injuries. Like I said, the strength, the flexibility, uh, and the muscular uh, endurance um, of the quadriceps, the hamstrings, any muscles that come into or out of the knee. We really want to focus on those. Uh, looking at flexibility and strength is, is important. Flexibility, remember, is, an, er, is a learned trait, right? We can increase our flexibility very easily. Um, with repetition. So we want to encourage our athletes to do that. Um, encourage your athletes to work with partner stretching. That can be very advantageous. And don't do anything ballistically, meaning quickly. Uh, we want to hold those stretches for a good 10 to 15 seconds at a time, uh, and then repeat them three or four times to, to get our maximum uh, degree of, of, of value out of our stretching. 
Um, dynamic stretching is also good, you know, where, where we're stretching, doing our initial dynamic warm ups, where we're um, like throwing a ball before we start stretching our, our arms, getting that, that nice dynamic stretch before we go into our, our actual uh, physical testing, physical stretching. Um, other things, just the flexibility in the hamstring muscle group in particular is important. Looking at the muscles in our low back or our erector spinae group is going to be also advantageous or, or helpful. Uh, looking at our groin muscles, our gastroc, again, any muscles that come into or out of the knee. Um, and then the, the reason why the erector spinae group is in there is because everything is about the core, right? Core strength helps with everything in the human body. So if we can have a, a good, strong core, our abs and our erector spinae group and our back, um, that will help uh, reduce the likelihood of injuries to, to other extremities. Other things we can do, balance board training, uh, work on landing strategies, uh, both double leg and single leg, single leg jumps, um, landing, coming off of a box and landing down and being able to control that and slowly come down and come back up uh, just to teach proprioception. Uh, and then shoes, just kind of watch what kind of shoes your, your kids are wearing as well. Make sure they're appropriate. Um, I said I would talk about knee bracing. Um, knee braces are not all the same. Um, they are typically made custom or fit custom to the athlete. Um, hopefully your, your kids aren't trading and, and sharing braces. That doesn't always work well. Um, we typically measure the, the quad at the, at the point where the brace is going to start and the calf at the point where the brace is going to end. We also have different types of metal supports and, and different levers in the, in the brace, different locking mechanisms in the brace. Uh, depending on what the individual athlete's needs are uh, consistent with their specific injury. So uh, just know this. Um, these are uh, the, the one on the left there is a type of brace that, that I might use for an ACL uh, or the one on the right where the hole is in the middle of the knee. I have some medial and lateral support for the MCL, LCL, uh, but I'm also looking primarily at knee tracking with that, with that hole in the knee. Um, just compression sleeves there. Um, the knee, the, the, brace on the bottom here on the right, something for patellar tendonitis. Um, these types of brace are more of a compression sleeve. I, they're not really doing a whole lot. Anytime I have a hole in the kneecap, I'm, I'm dealing with something with a patellar tracking issue. Uh, a lot of these braces have little um, C support, C-shaped supports in there that we put on the inside or the outside based on which direction their knee cap wants to glide. Um, so we use that little C support as a, as a damming mechanism uh, to prevent the kneecap from going out. So anyway, just understand that, that not all knee braces are made the same. Uh, different soft tissue injuries to the quad. Um, uh, when somebody gets hit in the quad, when they get a, a contusion to the quad, we have to understand that, that qu those quadriceps, that's a lot of muscle and that's a lot of blood and that's a lot of area for that swelling or that blood to accumulate in all that soft spongy area there. So we really wanna make sure that we're applying ice directly after any quad contusions, um, trying to eliminate the likelihood of it being able to swell, um, that the, any swelling that's in there can develop, can harden into the bone. That's what myositis ossificans is, um, that, that that swelling can, can harden up and can really affect that, the, the muscle's ability to, to do what they need to do. So just be aware of that, uh, be cautious about the return to play or RTP. Um, when we are asking them to ice, I, I thought I had a, a picture here, but I don't. Um, when we ask them to ice a quad, we wanna get that knee flexed, okay? We wanna get that heel as close to the butt as we can and have them ice like that. Have them lay on their, their back with their knee all the way pushed up to their chest and have them um, ice their quad that way. Uh, if we do that, then their quad reset muscles are fully elongated. That cold or that ice is getting into the nooks and crannies of that muscle fiber, that muscle tissue, and we're helping squeeze all of that swelling back so it gets nice and tight. And then obviously put a nice quad wrap on them or a, an ace wrap, a nice six inch ace wrap will, will help them quite a bit. Um, and then keep them off of it, right? And keep them to stretch it. Tell them not to get in a hot tub. We do not want any heat on that thing. That's gonna encourage vasodilation. We don't want that. Ice, especially for the first 72 hours in particular, 
And then once they're moving around pretty good uh, and we're looking at re-entering them into activity, then we can heat them again with the knee fully flexed up to the chest, have them heat that way um, to get that fiber done and, and then put a nice soft compression wrap up on their thigh from just below their hip all the way to the, the bottom of their knee just to, to kind of squeeze that, that thigh and, and give it a little bit of extra support. Um, soft tissue injuries to the hamstring, uh, the adductors, uh, those, strain, those strains are called groin strains. Um, the hamstrings are usually weaker than the quadriceps. That's normal. Um, we want to do things to strengthen them up, but we're never going to get the hamstrings as strong as the quads. It, it just isn't really possible. And maybe, I guess, if you're a freak, you, you can get them that, get them just as strong, but typically they're not going to be as strong. Um, I find about the hamstrings are about a third as strong as, as, as the quads. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, again, uh, flexibility exercises are important. Also, flexibility of the hamstrings can help prevent low back injuries and can help keep the core stronger as well. So uh, lots and lots and lots of stretching. Um, with groin injuries in particular, expect a little bit more time uh, for those to heal. Um, they can be pretty nagging. Okay, everybody, that's it for uh, knee injuries.